There you go. Hi, everybody. Um, back to the Moms at Work speaker series. Uh, we have someone who most of you are already familiar with, uh, Deborah Hudson. And Deborah, I'm going to give you a chance to introduce yourself to anybody who doesn't know who you are. Hi, Moms at Work group. Um, you guys are awesome. My name's Deborah. I am a employment lawyer. I practice all areas of workplace law in Ontario. I run my own practice and I've had the privilege and opportunity to help lots of the moms in this group, unfortunately, because uh, issues do come up. Not unfortunately, because I love working with you, but unfortunately, because <laughs> so many issues come up. Um, but yeah, so today um, I would like to sort of speak about some general uh, questions that come up in relation to pregnancy and maternity leaves. Right. And we get a lot I asked Deborah here because we get so many of the same questions coming up over and over again that we thought this would be a really great resource that you can share with, you know, other people who have similar questions and you can just point them right here because we're going to do some of that today. So why don't you let us know what we're going to talk about today? Sure. So um, I have like sort of uh, the basic top questions that come okay. up. And so I just thought I would go through, I'll sort of read what the question is and I'll go through that. Um, just note, I practice law in Ontario, Canada. So my questions are generally, uh, sorry, my practice is generally related to uh, professions that are provincially regulated in Ontario. Canada has very sim similar laws across the board, but just so you know, if you're unionized, you might also have some special, like some special treatment because of your collective agreement. So I'm just sort of flagging that um, generally, um, that's sort of where I'm going. So the first question that I thought I would ask is, can my employee, can my employer terminate my employment because I'm pregnant? Um, you know, unfortunately, I've had, you know, some women come to me, they tell their, their employer that they're pregnant, and then all of a sudden, they're terminated. Um, so the answer is, an employer cannot terminate you because you're pregnant. However, there are circumstances where it would be legal to terminate you even if you're pregnant. So uh, I guess the best example I can give is if you work, say, for a company and you work in a department of five people, and if your employer has made a business decision to shut down that department, just because you're pregnant, it's not going to mean they can't terminate you because they're shutting down the whole department. So, so the question that I would be asking you is, were you terminated because you're pregnant? And if there's any link whatsoever, even if it's one of five reasons, then it's discriminatory and contrary to the human rights code. Now that doesn't mean the employer might not do it. Unfortunately, employers do illegal things all the time. Um, but if they terminate you because you're pregnant or for any reason linked to your pregnancy, then it would be illegal and you could be entitled to more damages. Right. Okay, maybe you could explain. So a lot of people are unfamiliar with damages, right? So what would it mean to be entitled to, is that more money? <laughs> good question. Good yeah. question. And sorry for taking it for granted, but yeah, so damages in employment law cases, there's a few types of damages. So yes, it's money. It's mon It's usually monetary <laughs> remedies. Um, so it could be uh, loss of earnings. So notice, but it also could be extra damages. So loss of earnings would be like, I make $60,000 a year. I'm paid on a monthly basis. So maybe I get you know, depending on your length of service, I can't tell you how much you get, but you know, if you, you, you're going to get a salary continuance loss of earnings, that's what we'd be arguing for. But then there's another type of damages called human rights damages. And those damages are non-taxable damages would be in addition to the lost earnings notice portion. Um, you can also argue for things like legal fees, benefit continuation, and in the human rights tribunal, which is an unfortunately really slow process right now, but you can argue reinstatement, you can argue, um, you know, it's not commonly requested or awarded, but it's there. You can also request the employer uh, train management and you can, there's some other sorts of remedies that we can request. Great. Yeah. See, I think a lot of people don't know their options, right? I think that like there's lots of options here to go after those things. So it's, uh, it, there, it's a great opportunity to actually speak with someone to understand what you might be entitled to. Yeah. And the options just, you know, just, I think this is probably a good basic uh, understanding that usually the first thing that we do, if someone comes to me and there's a potential, you know, they've been terminated and we're arguing with the employer for more damages. The first thing I do is write a demand letter. It's a lawyer letter and it has all the facts. And I would say, the majority of my cases actually set or at settle at the letter writing stage. Now it's not everything. Um, you know, my best guess is maybe only 15 to 20% of my cases, I would start a lawsuit document or a human rights um, application, maybe even less because a lot of things do settle pre litigation. So um, that's something you would talk with your lawyer about, but um, 
good to know that it starts with a letter and many things are settled because it's an uncomfortable process to be in. Right. Like no, nobody wants to be in it. Good. Except me to fight Except for you. Right. Except you. Except you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's a great answer and a good, a good description of damages so that people understand what that is. Great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so like, I always like my client intake form has like, what's your salary? Do you get bonus? Do you get benefits? Like I, a good, a good counsel should be asking you all those questions because right. when we're asking for damages, we're trying to ask for all those things that you got. So something to prepare and think about is what is my compensation? And if you don't have all that information, you can guess, like don't over stress, you know, the information, but that's sort of something to put your mind to. <laughs> Yeah. So then the second question that I had was what happens if I'm sick or unable to work during my pregnancy? Right. Um, yeah. So this comes up. So if you have medical reasons why you can't work due to your pregnancy or for other medical reasons, unlinked your pregnancy, I mean, you have rights to either get a workplace accommodation or to take time off. Um, so I would, you know, always recommend going to your doctor, getting a medical note and understanding what your needs are. Is it an accommodation? you know, working from home or standing desk or, you know, time off for medical appointments, or is it actually time off? Those are going to depend on your circumstance, but employers uh, are required to accommodate any medical issue, whether it's linked to your pregnancy or not, uh, to the point of undue hardship, which is like really hard. Uh, so they have to give you those things. Uh, something to mention that, you know, employers are not required to provide you paid time off. However, many employers do have some paid personal days. Some employers have short-term disability leave. And failing that, there's also EI sick leave benefits. Also, you can start your maternity leave up to 12 weeks prior to your due date. So sometimes people who experience issues and they might have to start their, um, they might be recommended to maybe go off work six weeks or you know, before their due date. And in those cases, you can also start your EI or the, however, what I would say is if you, if you work for an employer that has short-term disability and you qualify, you're going to be much better off to go on the short-term disability for those six weeks and then start your EI after because your EI entitlement is limited to how much you can get. So if you do have that sick leave benefit, look into it and, and use the sick leave before, uh, before taking your EI um, maternity leave benefit. And I think we said like I we tend to look at this like a ladder, right? When you're looking at leaves, it's like look at what your employer offers you, look if there's paid leave options, look if there's sick time, because sort of like EI is is going to be there, but you may have lots of other options depending on where you work, right? Yeah, and EI, depending on what your income is, EI might actually be a lot less than your sick leave income and stuff like that. So I love uh, Allison, I love that explanation. Look at the ladder. If you have all these other benefits, let's use those puppies up before we go into the EI, you know. Um, because then, yeah, so so definitely like know what is available to you. And, and in a lot of cases, like an HR person might be able to sit down and tell you that, like if, you know, if your organization has good supports around that. Um, I worked in HR for a year at a, at a municipality that was fantastic. And they were, um, they would sit down with people and say, here's your rights, use the sick leave, you know, they were really good about it. That was a wonderful organization. You know, some organizations are not as wonderful, but you know, anyway, see what's available to you and use those resources. And I think we should caveat for people because people get really scared when you hear like short term disability. It's sort of just an extension of sick leave, right? So people are very scared to use it. It might be hard to qualify or whatever. And like your HR department should be able to walk you through and provide you with those forms. And it's just a form that your doctor fills out, right? It's not scary. It's not scary. It's not scary. It's not, no. And it's also, you pay into these things, use right. them like, like this, you know, if you need it. And you know, even aside from pregnancy, if you have like right now with COVID mental health stuff, or, you know, after you come yeah. back to work after your leave, it's a big adjustment. Like these, these are there for you, for you to use. So don't be afraid to use them. You know, right. that's going to be our takeaway from today's thing is don't be afraid to use the things that you've paid for. Right. Yeah. Yes. Use them. Use them. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah. <All right. laughs> Um, so yep. my next question was yep. how much time can I take off for maternity leave? So right. in Ontario, it was recently in the last few years. Now I'm getting older. A few years is like actually like 20 years ago, right. <laughs> but anyway, sorry, I digress. So you can take <laughs> up to 18 months. That's okay. the like short answer. And then there's sort of different compartments of it. Like okay. under the employment standards act, it's 17 weeks for pregnancy leave. And then if you've taken pregnancy leave, it's 61 weeks for parental leave. Right. Um, and so it totals a 18 months. Um, if, you know, under the Employment Standards Act, you're entitled to this unpaid time off. It's a separate and distinct entitlement from EI. And that's important because if you have two partners that want to take leaves, 
they can take leaves under the Employment Standards Act. So the parental leave, both partners can take. Um, and the parental leave, 61 weeks if you've taken the pregnancy leave or 63 weeks if you haven't taken the pregnancy leave. Both partners can take those that time off unpaid and then you apply for EI now you can't there's limitations on how much EI the couple can take together so so those are it's a nuance but but just you're entitled to the unpaid leave off and that's a separate and distinct uh entitlement from the EI part right uh and we always encourage people if you have very specific questions about EI to call them right to call the hotline because you're I'm, I'm hearing so many HR people give sort of wrong information because a lot of things have changed with new parental leave, things like that. So if if you have a complicated situation and you have a partner who wants to take leave and you're trying to figure it out, um, often it's best to just contact um, the hotline and they can help sort of sort it out and make sure you have all the forms. I love that advice and that advice is bang on. To be honest, I've been practicing law for 13 years and I, I'm even reluctant to answer EI questions because too. it's so complicated. And plus like you call a person, you get different answers, but yeah. they, they do call Service Canada, uh, you know, look it up the number for EI and get the answers for your own particular situation. Like Allison said, right now with COVID, you can qualify for EI uh, benefits a lot with a lower threshold than before. So definitely um, call yourself and get those answers. And it's confusing, so. <laughs> and it's confusing. Even It's for my people. job yeah. and it's confusing. Yeah, and that's, um, I, this is my full-time job and I'm always like, <laughs> you're gonna still need to call them though. I'm gonna tell you this and you're still gonna need to call them because it's complicated. Yes, it's complicated for yep. sure. So then my next question is, can my employer file, fire me while I'm on maternity leave? And it's going to be a similar answer to that pregnant, like, can they fire me when I'm pregnant question? And the answer is like, the short answer is yes, but only if the termination is not related or linked to the fact that you took a leave. So this is really complicated, but the types of questions I would be asking if someone calls me, I'm on maternity leave and I've been fired. Has yeah. anyone else been terminated? Is the workplace still open? Is your replacement who's filling your role still there doing your job? Is the department shut down? Because going back to my example, if the whole department shut down and they give you notice of termination, you're gonna wanna make sure they make the effective date on your return your return date, just so your EI is not impacted with your package offered. But other than that, if they've shut down the whole department, it's, it's legal. However, it will be illegal if they like terminate you, you're the only one terminated and your leave is still there and staying there. Why are you being terminated? It's because you're on leave. And this is a very nuanced question where you probably want to get a lawyer, but like to dig into some of the facts. But um, unfortunately, moms at work group, I see this way too much. Either like people getting while they're on leave or while they're coming back. And it's it, to me, it's very high risk. It's red flags, alarm bells going off, fire, smoke coming out the windows. Let's talk about it. I mean, and, and yeah. you know, we'll see if we can negotiate a better package based on the fact that it's very high risk and you might have more damages. And that's Any question? Thing, like, yeah, this is not this is not a, like a few people, by the way. This is not like one or two or three. The number of people, even just within this community, that that's happened to, um, it is a lot. So a lot of times people just say, "Oh, well, you know, I just don't want to fight this or whatever." It, I, I still encourage people to always do a consult just to just to like so that they don't have to like sit with it and try and figure it out themselves. Um, yeah, I don't sell legal services, but as but as someone who runs this group, I think it's a really good idea because I see too many women just walk away and think that, you know, there's something that they did and there's nothing that you did wrong. That's not okay. Yeah, quite frankly. So before being involved in this group, I had a few, a few of these types of cases along the way. And since being involved in this group, like it's actually really alarming and concerning and disgusting to me yeah. that this is going on so much because you know, just because, you know, your replacement's $5,000 cheaper salary or something like that, they still like, you're, you're still, you still have a right to your job back that, you know, just because there's a small cost savings, that's not a legitimate reason. The problem is, I can tell you here, it's illegal, but that doesn't stop the employer from doing something right. illegal. And where we left them, we need to try to negotiate something for you. But yeah, it is alarming to me, the number of uh, people that have come to me from this group. Um, based on such circumstances. So I'm gonna ask a question that goes exactly along with this because this is something else that we've seen in COVID is that, um, and I get asked this all the time, so I'm gonna ask you, if someone is laid off and then they see their company post a job posting, that's very similar to their job posting, uh, what do you recommend that they do? 
So the thing is with temporary layoff, it's sort of a new thing. Like before COVID-19, you would have layoff in certain industries being like construction or seasonal workers and seasonal hotels and vacation towns and stuff like that, you know, but layoff was not really that common. And there's a case from a few years ago that basically found unless your contract, your employment contract specifically allows for temporary layoff, even though the the Employment Standards Act, our, our minimum legislation allows for it, if your contract doesn't speak to it, it actually is arguably a constructive dismissal. Now, what I said to people at the beginning of COVID, this is unprecedented, it's a pandemic, you know, the courts are going to have more flexibility when these things are actually challenged. However, what I would say is, now we're like 10 months into the pandemic, it's going to be case by case. If you're, if you work for a restaurant and the restaurant's closed and you're laid off, okay, like, well, you know, makes business sense. But if you work like in HR and the business is not affected by COVID and it's really busy and now they've posted your job, then I would be having a consult with an employment lawyer to argue constructive dismissal and or discrimination, depending on, you know, I heard from people during COVID from moms that, you know, they had kids that they were helping, they were still working, but they felt that they were discriminated against because they had to deal with some childcare obligations, you know, change a meeting time or whatever. Um, those types of things are alarming to me. And I would say get a lawyer consult, try to either negotiate a package or return to work. It's not an easy, I, oh, it's such a hard thing right now with COVID, you know, but definitely they, they don't just have a right to do that. Right. And that's my, the banging point is like COVID is not the excuse, right? Just because it's COVID doesn't mean that all the laws go out the the window. Um, I'm hearing a lot of like, because of COVID, but um, always, always, always like check your, like be aware of your rights and be aware of your employment contract. And it's really important. We're going to keep, I'm going to keep hammering this. Deborah's not hammering this. I am hammering this, right? That's yeah, yeah, and it's it's disturbing to me. I think like, look, there are legitimate biz- like yep. a lot of businesses have suffered. And ba- like, my husband owns a spa. It's closed. I mean, now like they can do massage therapy, but they can't do anything else. So like, obviously, there's certain businesses that are le- legitimately um, affected. But I'm hearing from too many people that where it's like they pick the person on disability leave or returning from mat leave yep. or or or, and then we have a problem. So, right. lawyer up. Lawyer up. <laughs> um, okay, so next question. What rights do I have while I'm away on pregnancy parental leave? So, you know, one thing is that they have to continue your participation in the benefits plan if you still okay. have that. So under the Employment Standards Act, that's legally required. You're entitled to earn vacation time off, but that's not paid vacation. Yeah. So it's a different, it's very confusing and it's a different <laughs> right. Yeah. Some employers do allow you to accrue paid vacation while you're off, but it's not a legal obligation. So if you get two weeks vacation per year, you're off the full calendar year. When you come back, you have the two weeks unpaid time accrued. You've accrued your seniority, um, but you, but you don't have a right to the paid leave unless they have a a better policy around that. Um, Yeah. And I would also argue that like, you should be entitled to cost of living pay increases. So if everybody got a 2% cost of living pay increase, Um, you should be getting that too. That's not under the employment standards act, but it seems like, you know, out of like general principles, it's a pay increase based on the cost of living in 2021 or whatever year it is that you're watching this. Um, but you know, merit increases, I have a question about that later on and it's a little bit more complicated, but, um, you know, those are some of your rights while you're off. And then your rights on returning from leave. What are my rights when I return to leave? So that's, you know, so you're, you're entitled to be put back into your job if it still exists. And if it doesn't exist, a comparable job. So this is where I get kajillion questions from the group because often the company keeps the replacement and then they make some hodgepodge, random, sucky <laughs> job for you. <laughs> sucky and then, job, yeah. I say sucky, you like legal term, yeah. but like, yeah. I mean, just because I'm getting a call, they're like, my meaningful, like I love doing X, Y, and Z. And that was the best part of my job. And my replacement has it. And they're telling me to like, do all these things. Now, if it's going to be a case by case basis, but I'm particularly concerned if they've kept the person from your leave and they're still like doing your job Job. and then they're giving you some hodgepodge job or they terminate you. Um, these, then I, I have a, human rights related concerns because, right. and this is again, alarming happening too much. Yes. Um, what about title? So we've heard a lot of people who are like, Hey, I was an office manager before. And when I came back, they made me an assistant. <laughs> I'm just laughing because I've had like maybe yes. five of you, five of you <laughs> call, yep. call me and say this question. So, um, 
so it's not funny it's it's very uh it's very concerning and discriminating like i mean i guess a few of my questions are is there another office manager and were you ever an assistant and what's your pay and what's your duties and let's flesh this out right. um so i mean a demotion even if you have the same pay could be seen as a constructive dismissal and discriminatory so i would seek legal advice on on that for sure that's so my our takeaway here is that's not okay. You should ask questions if they're substantially changing your jobs or giving you a strange new title or giving you a hodgepodge collection of tasks that is not a job. Um, that is when you start. It, my, my line is always, I'm like, does it smell funny? Right? Like, does it pass the smell test? I'm like, then you might want to get, some, then you might want to get some advice on that because it, it's, it happens a lot, a lot more than you think it does. It happens a lot. And I mean, a few things, sometimes I tell people, sometimes people want to write a demand letter and negotiate a package because they don't want to return back to that. Or sometimes I tell them, let's, I help them write a letter. Like, let's say to the employer, this seems like it's not comparable. I have significant concerns in good faith. I'll try it for a couple months. Yeah. Like, so that you're, you're allowed to try it for a couple months, but I love flagging it saying, it seems like it's not comparable. It's not, you know, in accordance with what I'm legally entitled to, but let's try it. And then I'll like, and then you can loop back. Um, but yeah, I agree. If it doesn't pass the stink test, I trust all of your intuitions when you come to me and you're like, e, something's going on now. Like, obviously, like, let's say they've restructured the whole place and VPs are now all directors and directors are all now whatever it is. If it's just like that, then that's obviously not going to be related to the leave. So then it's not going to be. But that's usually not what we see. Usually that's not what, what I see. That's it's correct. Like that's, that's usually not what happens though. That's Very usually rarely. not the problem. That's yeah, true. Usually. Yeah. Um, so what else? Um, yeah, so now I have some of the questions that actually yep. got sent. So I have been denied performance review due to the fact I'm on maternity leave. Now I'm paid 8% lower than my co coworkers. So this is concerning to me. I would say, unfortunately, it's not like a straightforward answer. For right. sure, this is wrong. However, it seems intuitively like we have some good reasons why it might be discriminatory. Right. So like, I would want to flesh it out with the person. Like, for example, did you work 11 of 12 months and then they refused to give you a performance review when you really worked most of that year? Is, is it, you know, is your performance review linked with both merit increase and cost of living increase? Because if you're being declined, even cost of living increases, then I'm concerned. Um, uh, what else? Like, for example, like, you know, how long did you work that year? So if you, let's say you were off the full calendar year, in that case, I wouldn't expect them to do a performance review when you're off the full calendar year. Uh, you know, I'm just making up like sort of arbitrary dates, but, but so that's why we have to flush out the facts, but I would definitely think that it sounds like it might not pass the sting test and there might be some good arguments of discrimination and especially related to cost of living increases. So right. if you're just coming back, you're off for a year and you get nothing and there's like, you know, everybody else got at least 2%, like let's say the performance review, you get a range and there's a minimum range based on cost of living, then I'm, then I'm really alarmed and I'm still alarmed in the other case, but it's just, it, you have to sort of flesh it out a little bit. Yep. We hear this a lot too, that people come back from maternity leave and they're not given the opportunity for, to like have regular performance reviews and they make you wait a long time. And so those things are a bit concerning too, if they're denying you the opportunity to, to participate in, you know, company-wide initiatives for more pay, uh, that, that's, that's a bit, it's a bit weird. It is weird and it is concerning and like, yeah, yeah. So like maybe, like maybe if you're due for, if you're going off in February and you're due for a performance review right around then, maybe you ask for it early or you even right. say, can we make time while I'm off just to make sure I get it, you know, or it, yeah. immediately when I come back, you don't have to be, you don't have to be available to them when you're on time off. But I'm just saying, you know, just making sure that it's getting in there and being proactive about it. Cause unfortunately they might not be proactive about it for on your own behalf. Yep. Um, but yeah, it is concerning. It's very concerning. Um, and so it's definitely um, something that might be discriminatory. Yep. Um, and then the other thing too, is like, even like if there's opportunities for promotions while you're off, like you have a right to participate and, you know, uh, and be involved in those. So again, you want to sort of be proactive about it and maybe even say to them, like, if there's any opportunities, I want to be made aware um, because it could be discriminatory too, if they don't allow you to participate in those processes. Right. Um, what are my options if I don't have childcare? So um, these are sort of the last few questions. So yeah. 
you know, typically pre COVID uh, 19, you know, the em employees have an obligation to make reasonable efforts to secure childcare. And, you know, pre COVID 19, you know, you, you would have the obligation to get appropriate daycare or whatever else that looks like for you. Um, you would, you know, you would have the right if you've made such reasonable accommodation, uh, sorry, such reasonable efforts to ask for accommodation. So for example, let's say your work hours are 7 a.m. till three or something like that, but the daycare doesn't open till seven. You can, you can say to your employer, I've looked around, the daycares all don't open till seven. I have to start at 7.30. To me, that would be a reasonable request, but, you know, it, depending on the availability and stuff like that. Um, or you have to leave half an hour early. Again, it could be a reasonable request, um, but you do have to make efforts. So with COVID-19, everything sort of went out the window. A lot of daycares are closed. There's also reduced schedules. There's also a lot more protocols for picking up and dropping off. It takes a lot longer. So um, if you're having any of these issues right now, I would just encourage open communication with, I shouldn't have said if, because you're having all of these issues yeah. right now. Yes. Uh, yeah, because we are right now. <laughs> Um, yeah. I, I just would encourage open communication with your employer because this isn't going to ask forever. So the types of, right. you know, so, so what you can say is, look, the daycare is very, like, these are the issues with my daycare. I I'm requesting X, Y, and Z, and you need to work with the employer. And then right. sort of as a last resort too, you can request an unpaid leave. This might be relevant if, for example, your kid has a runny nose and you're not allowed right. to go to daycare for a couple of weeks. There's the infectious disease emergency leave under the Employment Standards Act. It's a protected leave. It's unpaid. All of which to say, you have to make reasonable efforts. It's harder to make reasonable efforts during COVID-19. Um, you're allowed to request accommodations like flexible work hours, later times, and you're allowed to request an unpaid leave. And then this is my line, do not quit, do not quit, do not quit. Um, request all those, avail yourselves of all those accommodation requests and unpaid leave. Like I would just say, um, and that might even include sick leave if you're stressed out due to like this is the the impact on you right now is is a lot. Um, like I, I meant you like all of you in this yeah. group who's taking care of children um, in this pandemic. So if you, you might even have like need like a sick leave due to mental health or other sick related uh, issues. So I would just say exhaust all your avenues of the types of leaves. Look at that ladder Allison was talking about. Um, but don't quit. You're allowed to request for accommodations. Now, what I, the caveat would be is like, if you, there is daycare available and you're just mm -hmm. like refusing on the base of, I, I, you know, I've decided I like to work from home or whatever. At some point, you're not going to be entitled to an accommodation. It's going to be a resignation at some point, but we're not there yet. So if it's COVID-19 related, let's try to get that unpaid leave and just try to work from there and then reassess once, you know, things are better, whenever that may be. Right. <laughs> when things are better. <laughs> Yeah. It's not funny, but we're like, we're holding on hope. There. Yeah. 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 I mean, now it is. Do we, do we have time for a couple more questions? Yep. yep. Okay. So um, my boss told me to find childcare or get a new job. What can I do? So this is sort of along the lines of the answer of my last question. Like, yep. is childcare even available? Like, and if there's limitations, I would encourage you to say to your boss, here's the childcare that I can secure. Yep. And Otherwise, I'm not like what's not available is X, Y, and Z. Can we work together to find a resolution? And if they terminate you based on that, that would be discriminatory. Um, but you have to avail your, you have to like look for what's actually reasonable. And maybe it's I don't know what that is for you or the area you live in or given your circumstances. But you make efforts, tell them what's available, and go from there. And and ask for an extension. So, for example, if for some reason you can't file childcare, maybe your maybe your children's daycare got shut down because of COVID nineteen, and you're looking, you could say, I would just be very clear. My yeah. my daycare got shut down. Um, we're looking for other options. Please, can I have four extra weeks to look for those yeah. options? Like, I would be very clear about that just to protect yourself because they can't yeah. force you. But if you don't, if you're just like choosing not to find it and there is options available at some point, then you might be deemed to have resigned. It's not a forever uh, accommodation, right. you know. And timelines are also important because I always caveat, like as an HR person, like you need, we can help you, but it can't go on forever. So if you say, I'm trying to look for childcare and I expect to have it in the next like two weeks, four weeks, like accommodations are not meant to be forever, right? They're not like, they're not, well, in rare cases, uh, but these ones are usually like time bound, right? So help us help you and say, you know what, we need four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, whatever it is, but, you know, let us know what that time is. 
Yeah. And something, one other thing to mention, which I haven't even got into is like, if you are immunocompromised or someone in your right. family has those health issues, so you can't, you can't use daycare for those reasons. That's a medical accommodation. Yeah. So just be very clear. Commu- exactly. Be clear communicating with your employer. Here's a medical note. We can't do daycare because of this. And so I need, I need either to work from home or unpaid time off. I'd prefer right. to work from home or I, you know, or I need unpaid time off. Like you can try to create your solution. It's not a one size fits all approach, but um, yeah. So just, I would encourage communication. Don't just ignore uh, timelines, all of that fantastic to protect yourself. Right. Um, and then the last question was, I'm going to quit, but do I have any other options? It was kind of a vague question. So I don't yep. know why you're going to quit, but if you're going to quit because you have the childcare issues. Don't do that. Let's like do those other things we just discussed. If you're, if you're really burnt out, maybe your doctor can, maybe your doctor's going to say you're suffering from, you know, whatever medical conditions and you need four weeks off. So right. whatever it is, I, I'm not a doctor. I'm not prescribing a random prescription, but I encourage you to, to speak to your doctor, whatever it is, if it's that you need unpaid time off, if you need vacation, if you need sick leave, if you need some time to find childcare accommodations, I would like sort of canvas all those options before quitting at some point quitting might be the right option for you but don't just quit because it's COVID-19 and it's stressful because I'm hoping in a few months it's not going to be like this right and that's the thing that's the we're getting I get a we get a lot of desperate pleas in the community that we're seeing that it is so much and other workers are not there and you're working 14 hour days and have childcare and whatever and and you know what it is too much that's absolutely too much and just like Deborah said, there are typically options available to you. So uh, this won't last forever, right? This won't let, be like this forever. Um, and, and I know for a lot of people, you know, school coming in and out and, you know, having school age kids and daycare kids and multiple things. Um, but like Deborah says, we should, we should just have little signs. It's like, don't quit, don't quit, don't quit. And when we say that, we just mean look at your other options first, right? Like, please look at your other options um, because you know, that will provide that financial stability that, that you need to be there. And, and that's an important thing too, to think about before we go all the way to the other side, right? Let's do it step by step. And there's a lot of job protected leaves that might yeah. be available to you, which means you're allowed to take the unpaid time off, have your job protected and come back at the end of that protected leave, whatever that is. So I encourage you to consider those options because it's not the best economy right now. And it's better to hold on to the job you have. And if it's not, you know, and then see what happens at the back end. But yeah, I'm, it's everyone's burnt out. And especially the moms who are getting the brunt of the work in this pandemic. So, um, so yeah, so know your options and don't quit, see all the options available and then go from there. Perfect. All right. So, uh, Thank you, Deborah, for being here for our speaker series. And uh, yeah, and as always, Deborah is in the Moms at Work group. We will have her email at the bottom of here so you can get in touch with her and her website. Uh, but I, we encourage you, you know, not as a sales point <laughs> for me to be like, um, it's, it's worth it very often to have someone else give you an opinion, a professional opinion, even to put your mind at ease that you're doing the right thing or that you have gone through all your options, right? So thank you for being here, Deborah. I really appreciate it, as always. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye.